O'Neill says judged the performance of the government. The Prime Minister yet to be briefed on Manus. And OFC favourites arrive for OFC Nations Cup. This is National MTV News with Meriba Tolo. Good evening and thank you for joining us for Wednesday's news. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill told listeners on FM 100's Talkback that government officials will meet with the UPNG administration to find a solution to the students' unrest. This follows the University Council's decision to suspend semester one indefinitely. The Prime Minister answered questions from the public relating to the current political events and other issues of national concern. Adelaide Curry reports. Full production. Prime Minister O'Neill said if the academic year of UPNG comes to a halt, it would be drastic because there would be new intakes next year and current first year students would not be guaranteed a space. He said government officials will meet with UPNG administration to discuss the issues. Uh, firstly, let me say that I'm certain to uh, hear that the uh, you know, suspension of the uh, semester at university of Papua New Guinea by the University Council. That's an independent decision that they have made. Uh, but I think it's uh, very, uh, it is going to be uh, very disruptive for many of our young students. Uh, because, you know, next year there will be more young students coming into, uh, into the universities. And those places will be given, pri those young students will be given priority uh, as, as students come in. So there is no guarantee that the uh, current students will continue next year. Uh, particularly those in the first year. So we are very concerned about uh, how, how this is uh, playing out. We have been uh, talking to our officials to sit down with the uh, university administration uh, uh, so we can find a way to save the uh, semester and save the year so that the government can help uh, uh, making sure that students continue their studies without disruption. A caller said the unrest at UPNG could have been contained if the Prime Minister had come out early on such talkback shows and gave clarity on the situation. The Prime Minister responded explaining that he had sent a delegation to UPNG to receive the petition, which was rejected in the first instance. Petitions are down to government and Prime Ministers allocate ministers to go and pick up these petitions. Because it is coming from all around the country, it's not only from university students only. So uh, there are cases where the petitions in uh, land on issues in Goroka or in Yonki or somewhere. We send ministers out to collect this and then we respond to them by technically assessing the uh, issues that they have raised. So uh, we may have, uh, we could have handled it a little bit better. But unfortunately, uh, we received the petition last Friday in writing. So uh, they, we, we did not know what issues that they were raising, how to respond to them until we, we got the issues on end. The Prime Minister Peter O'Neill gave some background on how the events unfolded. The police or even the task force sweep, when I established this investigation, uh, if they had some allegations against me, they have never even asked a statement from me or my staff. They have not asked a statement from uh, the police, have not asked for an interview. Uh, instead, they go directly and get a warrant. Uh, without Every person has got the right to be heard in this country by our constitution. Now, you go ahead and get a warrant based on what evidence? Uh, the recent statement of reasons are not being provided. We have not cited one. Inter even that's supposed to be a public document in court. So I have to challenge that warrant. I Adelaide Sirox, Curry National, MTV News. Also earlier today, Prime Minister O'Neill, in an interview with MTV's Business PNG program, shared his views on the UPNG student boycott. Oh, Prime Minister, thank you very much for, for your answers. Um, next year, you will, <coughs> there will be a, a, a national election in, in, in Papua New Guinea. It's very, uh, very uh, interesting and challenging time for you, I suppose. And uh, your relationship with the Papua New Guineans as a whole is very important. Mm -hmm. As we speak, as you know, there, there's been a, a student uh, a protest and demonstrations yes. here in several universities around the country. Uh, they have certain demands that you have answered mm -hmm. to them already. But first of all, I wanted to get a sense from you. I mean, this is an open and democratic mm -hmm. state. You know, how important it is, uh, you know, freedom of assembly and freedom of speech in Papua New Guinea? Uh, very important. I think, uh, you know, we've allowed uh, everybody to express themselves. We have heard uh, what they have to say. Uh, we have responded in a uh, democratic and free manner uh, as expected. Uh, so uh, now we, are, we are pleased that the students have uh, raised some issues of concern. Uh, 
the only issues that we have is that uh, the, the, there are some uh, lot of misinformation uh, which are not factual uh, that has been, uh, been, been propagate, propagated by uh, politically interested people using the students. A majority of the students have made their point they want to return to classes. But I understand that there are very few students who have been influenced by uh, politicians. I say politicians because the names that are popping up, uh, all of them are uh, candidates in the last election. So obviously they've got political interest. So uh, to try and, uh, uh, of course, strengthen their own position, try and get a better position in for the, for the elections in the, in the coming year. But uh, many of, of them have already been given the opportunity to run the country. Many of them have managed the country before. So what Papua New Guineans need to do is to try and compare our government's performance uh, to that of the previous governments. And if they feel that we have done the right thing, uh, this is a freak, express yourself in nine months' time at the elections. The reach will be issued on the 24th of March uh, 2017. Right. Express yourself there. If you don't like us, don't vote for us. Uh, this is a free and very democratic country. Some students at the University of Papua New Guinea School of Medicine say they want to return to class and appeal to the University Council to consider their request. The appeal was made today after the University Council gave the students 48 hours to vacate the school following the protests against Prime Minister Peter O'Neill, but students say the indefinite shutdown will affect them and appealed otherwise. Quinton Alom reports. The surprise noticed by the university's council yesterday for students to vacate the university's premises within 48 hours has not gone down well with students at the School of Medicine at the Taroma campus. Five students who spoke on behalf of the medical students say they want to return to class. After a meeting with the National Doctors Association on Monday, the students agreed to return to class and allow the issue to be pursued by the Doctors' Association. Uh, we would like to appeal to the um, University Council and the Senate to at least uh, consider us to remain on campus and then uh, we complete our procedures, fill up our logbooks, and then we uh, uh, go back and law class now. We will complete the uh, academic year successfully. The university's council decision yesterday for an indefinite suspension of classes will affect not only the medical attachment courses, but will also have a big impact on the tri-semester and block practice. The students say international students from East Timor, Solomon Islands and Vanuatu studying medicine will also be affected by the university's decision. We want to uh, get back to class, taking into consideration that uh, the medical school has uh, not only Papua New Guineans, medical school has uh, the East Timor, the uh, Solomon Islanders, Vanuatu, and other overseas, as well as the other uh, health workers who are already in the field, but they want to upgrade their skills for a year or so. They are appealing for a special consideration to be given to the School of Medicine at Taroma campus. We have exactly 14 weeks before the, we enter the workforce. 14 weeks. So it's not much time left. So, And then at the same time too, school fee, like a brief run on, it's like a self-sponsored student is paying about 10,500 kina. Meanwhile, some students at the main campus have already vacated the dormitories, while others with no relatives in Port Mosby left stranded in the school. But for those at the School of Medicine, they have appealed to the University Council to consider their request to return to class tomorrow, saying their school fees are expensive and the academic calendar cannot be readjusted. Quinten Alomp, National MTV News. The Supreme Court review of the case against Gumini member Nick Kuman is officially over. The review case was filed by former MP Lucas Dekena after an election petition in 2012. Today, the Supreme Court declared Nick Kuman as the duly elected member. In a media conference earlier this week, the Gumini MP was pleased to announce that the three-year court battle was finally over. 
The court battle started in 2012 after Mr. Kuman filed a petition in the National Court challenging Lucas De Kena's election win. After trial, the National Court declared De Kena's election win void and ordered a by-election. Kuman then filed a Supreme Court review challenging the by-election order, which then presiding judge Justice Batari ordered for a recount. After the recount, Kuman was declared the winner, and the case took a twist when De Kena filed a slip rule application, claiming Justice Batari at that time made a mistake in his ruling and De Kena's subsequent application seeking time extension to file the slip rule was dismissed last Monday, officially ending the long court battle. Uh, the judge decided to refuse the application for the slip rule to, be, uh, to progress any further, meaning that uh, the election petition case that uh, we uh, went to court since 2012 has concluded today. With only months away till the 2017 general elections, Kuman says the restored leadership in his district will see the flow of government services. Between 2012 and 2014, uh, we were not able to uh, provide leadership at the district level, and uh, a lot of things, the good things that came out from the from the government, uh, uh, we missed out. Now it gives me time for me to concentrate in in the job that um, I've been elected to do. Stanley Over Jr., National MTV News. Wearing his cap as the Education Minister, Nick Kuman commended schools throughout the country for handling the May 19th call for a public strike in a responsible manner. Kuman said in the midst of all the protests and politics of the country's leaders, education is still the government's top priority. He thanked all schools who kept their doors open for students to attend class saying it was the right thing to do. Meanwhile, Acting Education Secretary Dr. Uke Kombra shared similar views, saying schools will be notified to close down if situations get out of hand. On behalf of the department and the government, I want to thank uh, all the stakeholders in uh, the mainstream education in the country for their support in allowing all the schools throughout the country, uh, uh, right throughout the country, the doors were open to the students. Students uh, went to school, and it's a good sign that uh, we, they know that the education is, is important for their future, and uh, students attend classes and stuff is good, it's good for, for uh, students throughout, throughout the country. Uh, we thank the parents and the teachers who have uh, come send the children to school, especially in NCD. Uh, uh, but also we thank the uh, uh, boards and schools for letting the schools open and being very vigilant on, on last week, uh, Thursday. The preparation report on the upcoming African, Caribbean and Pacific Leaders Summit to be held in Port Moresby next week was well received by the 103rd African, Caribbean and Pacific Council of Ministers. Minister for Foreign Affairs, Rimbing Pato, gave the detailed report at the ACP ministers' meeting recently in Dhaka, Senegal. The chairman of the ACP Ambassadorial Working Group in Brussels and Papua New Guinea's ambassador to Belgium and the European Union, Mr. Joshua Kalinoy, said he is satisfied with the arrangements put in place by the National Organizing Committee. Among those expected to attend is the president of Zimbabwe, Robert Mugabe. You're watching National MTV News. We'll be back with more after these messages. Welcome back to National MTV News. The National Court in Ley today adjourned a sexual abuse case of a minor to Friday for sentencing of couple Gideon and Regina Bitton. The court heard that the couple had forced a 13-year-old girl to have sex with Gideon Bitton on numerous counts since 2013. And as a result, the girl was pregnant and gave birth to a baby boy in 2014. The victim's lawyer told the court Regina is the biological auntie of the victim and that the victim trusted her. However, Regina broke that trust and liaised with her husband and forced her niece to have sex with her husband, Gideon Bitton. The court also heard that the couple also threatened the victim when she refused. The court case involving two probationary constables alleged to have forced a young woman to swallow condoms in Port Mosby 
has been adjourned to June the 22nd. The adjournment came after their lawyer was not present in court this morning. It is alleged that Jacqueline Tanda and Joshua Yawija forced a woman to swallow three male condoms inside an interview room at the Barocco police station last December. Both were charged with three counts of abuse of office, deprivation of personal liberty and doing an indecent act to another person. The case is still undergoing committal proceedings. The Mount Hagen City Authority says it's committed to work with stakeholders to advocate on gender equity and balance. Chief Executive Officer of Mount Hagen City Authority, Leo Noki, made this announcement during a gender learning forum yesterday. He was the guest speaker at the one-day forum organized by Family Health International 360 and key partners. 30 people participated in the one-day forum to go through the global goal of sustainable development 2015 to 2030, the fifth goal. The fifth global goal is to achieve gender equality and empower women and girls, and that was the main topic of discussion at the forum. Special guest at the forum, Chief Executive Officer of Mount Hagen City Authority, Leo Noki, assured stakeholders that the authority would work together to achieve this goal. The authority as a, as a responsible organization sees the importance of such organizations like this, where we need to help our people to change their mindset and to bring about development and to bring about uh, progress, to bring about uh, an improved standard of living among our people. He said the society is gradually changing, with men being aware of gender equality and the important roles women and girls play in societies. In my village, when men are coming out talking during funeral services or during bride prices, I am happy to hear men speaking out about the woman being a partner. And this has never happened before. Men would refuse to acknowledge a woman, but these days the man is willingly acknowledging a woman. Western Islands Education Division has been an advocate of gender equality, promoting fairness in teacher appointments and staff appointments. The administration also uh, is, uh, is conscious on gender equality uh, with the education in the province, and they've also approved some of the uh, eye portions, as, uh, as you've seen, uh, as I've uh, seen in one of our, pres our presenters, Ms. Goimak, that we've got uh, 21 executive persons in our, uh, in our division, of which nine of these are occupied by, by our lady folks. And uh, we only, there are 12 uh, male folks in there. Uh, this shows that there's almost about one or two people different, and uh, there's, there's gender equality in, the, in our system there. Stakeholders from different sectors, including health and education, plus law and justice sector were part of the discussions. The forum is part of FHI 360's Community Lookout in Mary project and is implemented by its partners, the Western Highlands Provincial Health Authority and K1 Association. The forum was an avenue for stakeholders to learn about the sustainable development goals and contribute ideas on how change would be achieved in the province and the country as a whole. Michelle Amba, National MTV News, Mount Hagen. Elementary school-aged children in a part of Kerama town have accepted a debilitated building as their classroom. The rundown semi-permanent building in Kerama has not been maintained since it was built 17 years ago. This building, however, houses 70 children who attend Karaita Elementary School. There are so many things wrong with this classroom that you can be forgiven for thinking it is an abandoned building. The sad reality is it is home to three classes of young children, elementary prep one and two. When we visited the school, only this class, the year twos, were in school. The rest were not in class because their teachers were absent. Suzy Hui has been part of the school since it started 17 years ago. The school is an operating government school. She said there has been no maintenance work or renovation on this classroom since it was built. Head teacher Rina Kasi said they have money in the school account, but they cannot access it because their school learning improvement plan or SLIP is not in order. How are we going to help ourselves when, when these people are saying this? And as we are doing this, should we get a blame for this school here? I'm not going to blame the education. I'm not going to blame the board. But all the three have to get the blame. 
and with no access to school funds, the teachers have had to look elsewhere for teaching materials. Other teachers from especially our primary school and other schools, they help us with stationery. You see, half of my fortnight pay is go for the children. Just to graduate, educate the children while the children is in class. Three years before he or she goes to primary. Kasi said they had around 40 to 50,000 kina in 2012 and what remains now is 29,000 kina. With no access to the money for the last four years, Kasi is questioning the reason the education division uses to not allow them access to the school funds. But the question is I'm asking is the education policy is saying that if you put your sleep in place you will have to redraw the money does it say it's dead or no because we are confused the teachers say the school has been plagued with governance issues and have recently appointed a new board of management while the adults work to ensure money for this school is released the children from this part of Kerama town continue to aspire to learn in a classroom that is not falling down around them. Sarah Aupong, National MTV News. The Governor General, Grand Chief Sir Michael Ogio, yesterday executed on behalf of the state a contract for major rehabilitation work of a major road link in Central Province. The contract was awarded to a 100% local company, Loma Constructions Limited. The contract, valued at about 40 million kina inclusive of GST, covers approximately 40 kilometers of road upgrade and sealing from Gabone to Geno Junction along the Magi Highway in Central Province. This includes routine maintenance work from Gabagaba Junction to Gabone of about 11.5 kilometers, upgrade and sealing from Gabone to Geno covering 23.9 kilometers, and heavy maintenance work on the section of the road from Geno to Hula covering 13.4 kilometers. Local company Loma Constructions Limited was awarded the contract ahead of Dekenai Constructions Limited and Global Constructions Limited. Minister Pala expressed his satisfaction in the development being able to greatly help the transport industry, saying with a smile that PMVs will be able to last longer, thanks to better road conditions. goes through the most uh, populated area of the Riga district. So I'm really, really happy that this uh, contract has, has been awarded um, for sealing. I think it will affect the, uh, or it will improve the lives of uh, all the people on the coastal area. The contract is fully funded by the World Bank at 78% and the national government covers the remaining 22% of funding. Uh, these are two, two important projects under the uh, World Bank's uh, uh, road funds uh, you know, in, in uh, most parts of the uh, central and uh, Milton Bay. Uh, we just signed one uh, uh, 89 million water projects uh, last uh, week. Uh, this is the other one. Managing Director Cora Kali emphasized heavily on the importance of construction finances filtering into the national economy for the benefit of nationals and the country as a whole. The qualification criteria for government jobs is, is no longer I anymore. It's connections. But to qualify for Asian development projects, World Bank projects, OSED projects, you have to meet the requirements. The requirements are set very, very high. Korakali is adamant his company is ready upon qualifying for the project and stressed his excitement in having won the bid to take on the major road project as a 100% homegrown company. Lorraine Gabina, National MTV News. The Health Department is discussing avenues on how the 2012 National Health Accounts will financially deal with the implementation of health services in the country. This document emphasizes the department's budget spending on core areas within the health sector. Participating in this event are health officials and developing partners and agencies. Participants from the Department of Health and Developing Partners like Australia's Department of Foreign Office and Trade and World Health Organization in the second meeting re-examined the National Health Accounts. National Health Accounts uh, is a big information um, uh, thing that we need to provide to government so everybody knows how the healthcare is financed. Uh, and all in all for us to 
to provide uh, equitable health services to, to all uh, the citizens of this country. This document is a comprehensive snapshot of the financial resource flows of the country's health sector. It is produced based on the system of accounts called SA 2011, developed by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development called Eurostat and World Health Organization. Deputy Secretary National Health Policy and Cooperation Services, Elva Lionel said, it is useful because it will track the department's spending over a period of time. I think with the government uh, policy on uh, free health care, uh, we, we, it's also crucially important for us uh, to know the total you know, cost of the health care in this country, and uh, as well as that for government and for planning uh, to appreciate what it costs you know, to deliver the health care. Most importantly, it will integrate the collection, processing and analysis of both primary and secondary sources of health expenditures data. Papua New Guinea's current health expenditure stands at 1.2 billion kina, which mainly go towards financing healthcare system and administration with a cost of over 400 million kina. This document will assist policy makers, planners, program managers and other stakeholders to make informed decisions to budget its spending only on core areas to deliver health services effectively. PNG established its NHA in 2000, but has undergone slow progress due to inadequate institutional capacity and lack of cooperation. Eric Arupma, National MTV News. And now a look at the finance news. The Kina opened unchanged at 0.3160 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina was buying 0.3085 US dollars, 0.4260 Australian dollars, 0.2738 Euro and 33.69 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, copper closed higher, gold and coffee closed lower, while cocoa closed the day unchanged. Palm oil closed lower, while crude oil and copper closed the day higher. And on the stock markets, the Dow Jones closed at 213 points higher, the ASX closed 85 points higher, and the Olodmiris closed 82 points higher. In the news ahead, the Prime Minister awaits a briefing on the Manus Asylum Centre and the latest on the kidnapping of journalists in South America. Stay with us. Welcome back to the news. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill is waiting to be briefed on the latest meeting between the government officials of both Australia and PNG on the Regional Processing Centre on Manus. Mr. O'Neill said the government respects the decision of the Supreme Court that ruled last month that the detention of asylum seekers was unconstitutional and illegal. He said while PNG is ensuring the personal liberty of the refugees, officials are also cautious that a large number are not genuine refugees. Responding to a call-out of the FM100 talkback show, Prime Minister O'Neill said PNG re-established the regional processing center on Manus, honoring the agreement between the Somare and Howard governments. The offshore processing center was established to deter boatloads of refugees arriving and resulting in thousands of deaths at sea, especially women and children. I did it basically because uh, uh, we had an obligation to be a... Uh, uh, a member of a regional uh, community in the Pacific where uh, kids and mothers and, and people were losing lives at sea. Well over 2,000, I think it was close to 3,000 uh, people lost their lives. Since the Supreme Court in PNG ruled the detention of asylum seekers illegal, PNG now has no choice but to implement the court order, including ensuring the personal liberty of refugees. However, it's been also found that many of them are not genuine refugees and this is raising concerns. Large number of them are not genuine refugees. It has been now established that. Many of them uh, have not uh, identified them properly because they have uh, uh, lost or deliberately have misplaced their uh, passports. So their country of origin is, uh, is proving to be difficult to find out. So some of them come from Iran or some of them come in from Afghanistan. Officials now want to seek clarification on some of the court orders. The officials are recommending uh, that uh, they might go back to court to ask for clarity. Clarity on, the, uh, on the, some of the court orders that has been made. So uh, I will, uh, of course, make a public announcement uh, as soon as I get the official uh, uh, briefing from the office, our, our own officials on the discussions uh, they just concluded last Friday in Kent. Delhi Waigeno, 
National MTV News. To news abroad now, and two journalists have gone missing in Colombia's northeast conflict zone while covering the disappearance of a Spanish reporter feared kidnapped over the weekend. Local media said there had been a possible kidnapping of a reporter and a cameraman near the border with Venezuela. The journalists were in El Terra City to cover the disappearance of fellow reporter Salud Hernandez, who writes for Spain's El Mundo and local newspapers, who was last seen in the area on Saturday. The heads of the army and the police will go into the province to direct search operations for Hernandez and the other journalists. Military sources and local media have speculated Marxist rebels or crime gangs operating in the area may be responsible for the disappearances, but the government has not yet classified them as kidnappings. Three other reporters in the region to cover Hernandez's disappearance were briefly held by armed men who identified themselves as members of the National Liberation Army or ELN rebel group before being released. The country has been in peace talks with bigger rebel group, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, since the end of 2012 and recently agreed to start negotiations with the ELN. President Santos has said no talks will begin until all ELN hostages are freed. The 2,000-strong group has increased oil pipeline bombings in recent months and continued kidnappings in what many see as an attempt to pressure the government into beginning talks. Vanessa Knight, NTV World News. The parents of an injured Australian climber traveled to Nepal on Monday to help their son retrieve the body of his wife from Mount Everest after she became the second person to perish on the world's highest mountain in as many days. Maria Stradom, a 34-year-old university lecturer, developed altitude sickness and died whilst descending from the summit on Saturday. Stradom's husband, Robert Gropel, was part of the climbing team and also suffered high-altitude pulmonary oedema on the descent. Gropel's parents arrived in Kathmandu on Monday hoping to arrange a helicopter evacuation for their son and his wife's body to Kathmandu. The deaths of Stridham and Dutch climber Eric Arnold are sober reminders of the deadly risk of scaling the 8,850-meter peak. Their ascents are among the first in three years. An Indian mountaineer also died on Sunday while descending from the summit of Mount Everest, making it the third fatality in as many days. At least 18 people died a year ago when an earthquake sent a massive snowslide careening into base camp, while an avalanche in the treacherous Kumbu icefall killed 16 guides in 20. 2014. The back-to-back -back tragedies had halted climbing on Everest. Penasonite, MTV World News. You're watching National MTV News. Trukai Sports is next, and the favourites in Oceania football arrive in Port Moresby this afternoon. Stay with us. Tukai Sports. Welcome to Tukai Sports. In football, favourites New Zealand arrive today for OFC Nations Cup after a three-week-long training camp in Brisbane. Excited for the match again on Saturday against Fiji, they are prepared to take on their opponents and coach Anthony Hudson says with the experience of captain Chris Wood from the British Premier League, his side is here to win the tournament. New Zealand arrived today to a warm welcome as coach Anthony Hudson said playing in PNG is a privilege for them. Coach Hudson added that most of the players are not new to the playing conditions here as they have been here. He added the team is at ease with the matches they are going to play. Players this is obviously our first team so uh, we have a strong team, strong squad and we come here, we, we know we have to respect everyone in our, in our group, in the competition and we're just, we're, we're really, really excited now to get started. Teams that arrived today as well were Vanuatu, Samoa and USA, all looking fit and ready for the matches. The last team to arrive today were Lekagu from New Caledonia. Seen as the ones to beat, the team will face PNG on Sunday. Dini Rose Raiko, National MTV Sports. To women's football now and the PNG under-20 women's team was left scoreless at full-time by a classy Japan side on the opener 
of the Tri-Nations friendly match at the Sejongai Stadium in Port Moresby last night. It all started in the first half of the match when Japan striker Juri Kawano nailed the first for Japan in less than three minutes after kickoff. The Sejong Guy Stadium was filled with chanting and singing from the spectators. They turned out to witness the first ever international friendly against Japan and PNG. Japan reminded PNG why they are a force in global football when it took them just minutes to get on the scoreboard through striker Juri Kwano. With the swift strike past goalkeeper Lavina Holov. <laughs> Kawano belted two more goals for a hat trick within 15 minutes. It was a one-sided affair, as the already exhausted PNG girls tried to control a lot of mishandling while trying to break through their fast and tricky opponent's defense line. The young Nadashiko added another three goal to seal a 6-0 lead over PNG at half-time. PNG, realizing their mistakes in the first half, made little advance in their opponent's territory but kept falling short on target. In the dying stages of the game, PNG striker Ramona Padio had the crowd momentarily on their feet with a long-range effort that sent Japan's Mamiko Matsumoto in full stretch to nudge the ball out. However, Japan maintained their class in the second half with another four goals. The last coming from penalty to beat host PNG under 20 team. Ten goals to kneel at the full time whistle. Japan will play powerhouse Team USA on Friday in what is expected to be a blockbuster. Shane Saroya, National MTV Sports. To swimming and Papua New Guinea will send eight swimmers to the 2016 Oceania Championships. The veteran and three time Olympian Ryan Pinney leads a fairly young group of athletes, including Ashley Sito, another veteran of the team at 28 years of age. Sito currently holds the national record in the long course 50 meter breaststroke. 16 year old Leonard Kalate and a pair of 17 year olds, Ryan Maskelin and Shenis Paraka, are the youngest in the team. Barbara Valley Skelton, the national record holder in the 50 and 100 meter breaststrokes, is also on the roster as is 200 individual medley national record holder Stanford Kawale. Leonard Kalate and Samuel Segers complete the group. Rob Van de Zandt will serve as a coach for the meet. True Guys Sports continues after the break. Stay with us. True Guys Sports. Welcome back to Trukai Sports. PNG RFL CEO Bob Cutmore has placed a media ban on all SPPNG Hunters players after their disappointing loss to Central Queensland Capras last Saturday. This was made clear by SP Hunters assistant coach Nigel Hukula. Assistant coach Nigel Hukula says the ban was imposed because they would like their players to concentrate more on training. Efforts, uh, especially in training and, and also importantly, the the work that happens off the football field so and that's preparation for ourselves both uh, mentally and physically so Hukula also said players get carried away with what they say on camera or reading the papers or on social media and would like to curb away from that for a while trade on getting ourselves back right both off on on the field so that um, we get the desired effect that we want which is um, obviously uh, uh, the wins on the field and off the field the ban has been placed for an indefinite period of time till PNG RFL makes a decision to get rid of the ban. The Hunters are third on the Queensland Interest Super Cup ladder on 16 points. They play last year's champions Ipswich Jets in Brisbane in this weekend's Round 12 clash. Elijah Lavette, <laughs> National MTV Sports. Queensland has named their team for Game 1 of the 2016 Holden State of Origin Series at ANZ Stadium on June the 1st. The Maroons have named two debutants with Corey Oates and Justin O'Neill set to play their first State of Origin matches for Queensland. They come in for the retired Justin Hodges and the injured Will Chambers. Darius Boyd will take the fullback role with Greg Inglis to return to his former position at left centre, while Matt Gillett will start in the back row alongside Broncos teammate Sam Thiday. The team is dominated by 2015 Grand Final combatants, the Brisbane Broncos and the North Queensland Cowboys, who have supplied 10 of the 17 players named. 
One viewer from East Sipik, George Numbasa, fronted MTV to find out the, about the telecast of a State of Origin match next week. He said viewers in the East and West Sipik provinces are mostly working class people who are able to watch the match on a play box, while many will miss out. Uh, state of origin, big black like, games are winning hand from Papua New Guinea. St state of origin is coming up very shortly, two weeks from now. Now, concern for me now back in East Sipik province. Um, but I want to rugby league or no God. Because uh, I want to look at my line, you said you got a uh, play box, belong, uh, belong diesel company. They, they are the only ones watching um, uh, rugby league on this uh, TV one, belong uh, diesel. But in East Sipik and West Sipik, you know God, play box. You know God, just like coverage, belong play box. The only money man, all working class people who say they got money, all you buy, all you come from Mosby, all you buy this little red plastic click or disc, no go mounting on top long head, long house, now all you walk long words. You know, plenty. One, one, two, two, ten plus, that's so all long we work, all you make him this la. The rest of the population, how about you watch him, state of origin? And that ends Trukai Sports. We'll have for you the weather details when we come back. Trukai Sports. True Kai Sports. Taking a look at the weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in the southern region, Port Mosby, evening showers or two with a possible thunderstorm, brief showers in Daru, Kerma Alota and Popendeta, a shower or two. To the Momase region, Lei and Madang, a shower or two, cloudy periods in Wiwek and Vanimo. To the New Guinea Islands region, Lorangao, Kavian, Kogopo, Rabaul, Kimbe and Buka, chances of brief showers. And in the Highlands region, Mount Hagen, Goroka, Kundiawa, Mendi and Wabeg, evening rain showers with morning fog patches. A look at the forecast for small ships for the next 24 hours. All coastal waters of Papua New Guinea see 0 0.5 to 1.3 meters. A look at the ocean forecast for PNG areas in the Coral Sea, sea is slight with southeasterly winds at 10 to 15 knots. Solomon Sea, sea is slight with clockwise winds at 10 to 15 knots. Bismarck Sea, sea is slight with northeasterly winds at 10 to 15 knots, tending southeast after 10 pm. And for the Pacific Ocean, sea is slight with northeast to southeasterly winds at 10 to 15 knots. Before we go, recapping our main stories for tonight. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill says judge the performance of the current government. The Prime Minister yet to be briefed on Manus. And OFC favourites New Zealand arrive for OFC Nations Cup. And that's the new sports and weather for today, Wednesday the 25th of May 2016. On behalf of the MTV News team, I'm Mary Batulo. Pleasant viewing. Good night. <laughs>